So I would now uh, like to introduce uh, Kim Sito, who is the program director of the Public Art Program at New England Foundation for the Arts, um, as well as a wonderful colleague and a core collaborator on this event and series. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Emma. Um, as Emma mentioned, I'm Kim Zito, Program Director for Public Art at the New England Foundation for the Arts. Um, and for those who might not be familiar with NIFA, uh, NIFA is one of our six regional arts agencies across the US, and we work in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts, our state arts, agen state arts agencies here in New England, and private foundations to invest in artists and communities to foster equitable access the arts in New England and across our nation. And you can always learn more <laughs> at our website, um, nifa.org. Um, but really glad to be here and really thankful for this ongoing partnership with MAPC's arts and culture team. Um, Co-hosting these discussions um, has been really wonderful to bridge, uh, bridge and broaden our understandings of how artists can and are impacting the culture of our public spaces and our planning efforts um, and why this creativity is so essential to our shared work of cultivating more just, more vibrant communities and our understandings of the public. Um, and so it brings me great joy to introduce our moderator for today, Kenneth Bailey. Um, Kenneth is co-founder of the Design Studio for Social Intervention, along with Lori Lobenstein, who um, you can see in the gallery, but you'll get to hear more from Lori um, next week um, in our second discussion. Uh, Kenneth has over three decades of experience in community practice and brings a unique perspective on the ethics of design in relation to community engagement, the arts, and cultural action. Kenneth, along with Lori, have introduced me to the concept of spatial justice and have helped me to question how public art can play a role in making the normal strange rather than perpetuating the norms that reinforce a variety of injustices in our um, public, sp public spaces. Um, and with that said, I'd like to hand the mic, the virtual mic, over to my co-conspirator and trusted friend in this work, um, Kenny Kenneth Bailey. <laughs> and um, he's going to lead us in this discussion today about spatial justice and planning for more welcoming in public spaces. Mute. There, I had to unmute. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, exit full screen. Can I go to slideshow? Did that work? No. Exit screen and now go back to slideshow. Here we go. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth Bailey. I'm one of the co founders of Design Studio for Social Intervention. And um, why is it doing this? I didn't want it to do that. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, this framework of spatial justice before I introduced our speakers. So um, we started doing this work on spatial justice because um, as a design studio with a focus on sort of imagining new ways to solve social problems, we saw that um, in a lot of um, social um, change or social justice or civil society or government agency organizations as they try to approach um, problems that have to do with social justice, we would often ascribe those problems specifically to the bodies of people that we were um, either thinking about or hoping to make things better for without an understanding of the ways in which those bodies inhabit and um, those bodies inhabit space and the ways in which space um, spaces are actually um, produced in ways that are part of producing or perpetuating or um, exacting injustice. Um, to go back to the examples around indigenous sovereignty that Emma talked about, we can look at those examples. We can look at examples around um, um, Black life in the United States from its um, inception to now. Um, both of those communities, Black and Indigenous communities, have had to not just deal with injustices along their bodies, they've also had to deal with injustices 
inside of their spaces from having land taken from you, from being taken from land into another place. So this idea of spatial justice really is about recognizing that space is an, is an aspect of the perpetuation of justice and injustice, and that if we want to create social justice, we have to understand how, how it actually operates inside of space. Um, so the framework we like to use around this um, thinking is the rights to be, thrive, and express and connect. Um, the rights to be, thrive, oh, I have it. Oh, I'm, I'm, um, thank you, Lori. I thought I did share it. Um, did you? Sorry, I thought um, I'd shared my screen. Lori just told me I didn't. Um, <laughs> That's why I get the big bucks. Zoom, Zoom. Start with a share screen, green share screen at the bottom. Do you see that? There we go. Did it work this time? Share. There we go. And now back to preview. And now back to slideshow. Um, thank you, Lori. So, um, one of the, oh, it's still doing that. So, one of the um, things we like to think about with this framework around rights to be, thrive, express, and connect um, is particularly as we're thinking about cities and towns. Um, one of the ways spatial justice or spatial injustice shows up is in who we imagine is our um, primary public or our desired public. Um, and then what tends to happen is from that imagination, from that um, perspective, we then design and comport public space to match that public. Um, and often that public or not the publics that we were just talking about in terms of indigenous communities or black communities or other communities of color, they're, they're often sort of what we conceive of as American publics, which then um, functions as a kind of default for who we imagine as white, um, which then means that we shape um, um, public space um, to really match one category of people that we've imagined and we don't necessarily um, then comport space to match the multiple communities that need to occupy and share it. So the two examples we have here, um, the town of Walpole, um, um, where we see this picture here is sort of, that picture sort of speaks to white imaginary, as does this um, um, problem that we've talked a lot about and you've heard a lot about in the Boston Seaport District, you know, one of the newest um, renovated spaces that's also one of the widest spaces in Boston. So the space itself is doing work. The space itself is actually um, participating in a form of social injustice. And when space is organized in a way to um, produce and sort of um, project um, that it desires one kind of public at the behest of others, that's a form of spatial injustice. Um, and what we're trying to do is figure out how do we rethink these kinds of um, interventions that we make in space in order to make spaces welcoming for all. Um, Again, who gets to thrive in space? Um, and one of the things we also have to think about when we're talking about thriving is who actually gets to exist and be and get to go home and, some, and afford to be in space and also who gets to um, economically and culturally thrive. Um, and again, we see sort of a, a reflection back to the programming of public spaces that um, imagine a kind of user and at the behest of, of other users um, and the sort of new 
um, development regimes we are experiencing um, across Boston and across the United States where we're building um, like this example of the um, Temple condominium rendering um, here um, in Jamaica Plain in Boston, where we're, build, we're building um, new places for dwelling or inhabitants that are really, 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 really expensive, um, which then has a class dimension to who gets to actually find a place to live in a city um, like Boston, in a city surrounding Boston. So. Um, this idea of who gets to dwell, who gets to um, reap economic benefit or cultural benefit, who gets to thrive in this space um, is also another dimension of spatial justice. Um, who gets to be in um, public space? Um, as we are experiencing right now with um, social movements against state sanctioned violence across the globe, particularly um, in the United States, we recognize that um, for certain communities, literally being in space um, um, produces anxiety um, and, a, you know, um, you, you're faced with um, the sort of question, is any, it, will I be attacked by the, by the state? Will I be attacked by um, some set of people acting as if they are the state? Um, and these questions of then moving through space and, and wondering to the, the extent to which you're actually safe from the people who are supposed to be responsible for protecting space is another form of spatial justice or spatial injustice in that sense. Um, it reminds me um, of the idea that um, uh, the police force are, are produced to sort of border um, to patrol the border of whiteness or to patrol the border of um, who actually gets to um, enjoy the American dream in public space. And as we recognize those kinds of things um, as artists and as um, planners and policists, it's, upon, it's, it's incumbent upon us to figure out how do we address these kinds of things because there are other forms, there's the forms of not just social injustice. Well, well, there are forms of social injustice, but they have a spatial dimension. Um, that means people literally can't sort of occupy spaces that they should have a right to. And last, um, well, two more. Who gets to express themselves um, in spaces in New England? We often, um, create lots of opportunities for fandom. Um, and then we have the water fire example here in Providence, but both of those examples tend to um, tend towards, um, again, these imagined publics that um, um, are white. Um, although I will say the water fire um, event in Providence is a, a, a fairly more um, diverse uh, um, event, but Still, the, the, the point that we're trying to make here is who gets imagined um, as the public and then um, who actually gets to take up space and then create sensation with sound and bodies and sight and um, design, who actually gets to um, be, um, enjoy themselves in large crowds and spaces without having to worry about being in space and being policed or, or somehow um, threatened by other regimes. And another way you can look at this question here is what public and private infrastructures then comport themselves to afford these kind of communities the right to express themselves? Um, and that's another dimension or another aspect of how space um, either shapes itself around perpetuating injustice or not. And then last, transportation and connecting. Um, is it easy for you to get um, from where you live to where you might try to work or to visit your friends or to visit loved ones or to visit green spaces? Or is it, do you have access to internet? Um, um, these, these questions of who gets to connect and how are also, um, ways in which the space itself um, is enmeshed in forms of justice or injustice. Um, 
I can think for myself now living in Dorchester, it's much harder for me to get access to um, groceries than it was when I lived in JP, just three miles from where I used to live. And simply because of the way the trains run and the buses run from one community to another, um, my access um, is a completely different um, story. So um, when you expand that across large social groups, um, then you're looking at the capacity or the lack thereof to connect affecting your um, access to the things you need, which is another aspect of how space is in, enmeshed in justice. So we wanted to just quickly give you that overview to have a sense of how spatial justice operates and to get a sense of what we mean by spatial justice. I also want to do a, um, a plug. If you're interested in these ideas of spatial justice and want to read more about it, we have a, a, a magazine that we did called Spatial Justice 2.0, which was based on the original paper we wrote sort of looking at this frame um, around our rights to be, thrive, express, and connect. And I want to pick on um, Molly and Anthony because they both are um, somewhat featured in the, um, in the zine. Anthony's colleagues um, wrote a piece on sound um, and we, um, we still stuck him in even though he wasn't one of the authors, we just love him. And Molly with University of Orange also wrote one of our um, articles um, for Spatial Justice 2.0. And um, now, um, and so I just wanted to give you all that reference to say that if you want to read more about these ideas, that's a good um, resource. And I want to get out of this now. Close this and to get out of um, screen share, do I just hit new share or did you guys pull me out of it already? You hit stop share. Oh, I did? No, you, you need to, but I can also. I need to oh, hit stop share. I just did. I did that. Great. And now, um, thank you guys. You would think that I've never driven a Zoom. I have to drive Zooms all the time, but it, it always confused me. But I want to introduce um, both Anthony Romero and Molly um, Kaufman. Um, Molly is an urbanist, a journalist, um, a good friend, um, and she is one of the directors of University of Orange, a free people's um, university um, that's really focused on urbanism and placemaking um, from the bottom up. It's looking at how do you engage residents and communities in the um, work of doing urbanism. And um, Anthony is a local artist, a dear friend, and a professor at um, Tufts um, um, Museum of Fine Arts, uh, um, the, the School of the Museum of the Fine Arts, um, which is part of Tufts University now, um, and an amazing artist and a, a dear friend, and both are contributors to our um, resource on spatial justice as well. So I want to give Molly um, seven to ten minutes to talk um, about her perspectives on spatial justice um, and development and then turn it over to Anthony to do the same thing and then we're gonna give you an opportunity to talk in groups about what we've all said. So Molly, is that, is I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Great. Is my audio okay? Okay. We can't hear you. So much. Okay, great, great, great. Um, Lori is actually going to share my slides because I had a really strange computer meltdown just before this started. My computer wouldn't stop ringing, so if anyone knows what that's about, you can hit me up in the chat and help me fix <laughs> it. Um, but Lori is a really good friend and colleague, and I shared my slides with her, and we all know, if you know Lori, that she'll handle business for you. Um, so as Kenny said, I am from the University of Orange, Actually, um, I have observed that two of my colleagues from U of L, Aubrey Murdoch and Newport Chowdhury, are also on this Zoom. So if either of you feels like 
jumping in at any time, please feel free or hop on the Zoom. Um, so we are, um, actually I've loved being introduced by Kenny because he did such a nice job talking a bit about um, our work. Um, but as he said, we're a free school and an urbanism school. We're based in Orange, New Jersey. Um, so not New England, but I think as you'll see, we really are gonna um, share struggles and be able to really exchange solutions and ideas. Um, we offer free courses that are in a variety of subjects. We have a lot of volunteer teachers, so it's kind of whatever people want to teach. Um, since the pandemic, for example, we've had reading groups, bird watching classes, a guitar class from around the world. Um, but we also share and teach our approach to restoration urbanism. And for us, that's really understanding how racist and classist policies have sorted cities and fractured people socially and physically, and to really understand that it's the task of the urbanist to think about how we reweave social fabric and re-knit the physical spaces to promote equity in our city. Um, so that's a little, yeah, so that's a little bit about who we are. Um, right now, one of something really cool we're doing is hosting a reading group of ideas, arrangements, effects with a design studio. So if you want to come pop on to our last session and join a uh, free UFO reading group, we would absolutely love to have you. And as Aubrey pointed out in the chat, in this slide collage of kind of UFO in action, there's Kenny and Laurie teaching a class as urbanists and residents. Um, so this is some of what's been on our mind when we're thinking about this question of spatial justice and making welcoming public spaces. Can we see the next slide? So this is a recent study about uh, Park in New York City by the Trust for Public Land. And um, I heard this, these numbers reported on NPR and then I had to go look them up so that I could see them. And as you can see, it says that the average park size in New York City is 0.4 acres in poor neighborhoods versus 14 acres in wealthy neighborhoods. The average park size is 7.9 acres in predominantly black neighborhoods versus 29.8 acres in predominantly white neighborhoods. And, um, and also as this is from a New York Times article, as the article pointed out, even though New York City's network of parks is one of the country's largest, it was created piecemeal as real estate developers built up neighborhoods. So not only are there fewer parks in lower income communities of color, often they're, um, they can be more like little pocket parks or built along in uh, not the most welcoming park sized places. So this is the reality of the situation that we're dealing with now. And I would, um, looking at those numbers, just like to speak for all of us and say that that's not the society that we wanna live in and that's why we're here. Um, one of the things that we talk about at University of Orange when we're under is the importance of understanding the history of policies that have shaped our built environment. So if we see the next slide, what you'll see is the redlining map of Orange, New Jersey. And um, so we all know redlining maps were made in the 40s. And, uh, but as you can see, if you see this redlined area and you see where that area is today, this is an aerial map of today and there's significantly less tree cover. So we see that these decisions and these plans that were put in action decades ago still affect our lives today, still affect our access to green space and health and the value of our properties and being able to be near old trees. And as um, <laughs> Aubrey knows, you really feel it when you're walking around Orange on a hot sunny day trying to get from place to place and there's no shady trees. Um, so next slide, please. So this is um, some of the themes and principles that we wanted to share with you today. One is that if we're thinking about making welcoming public spaces, we have to advocate for people's right to stay and we have to say stop displacement. I, um, my mother is Mindy Fulelov. She wrote a book, I'm not, some of you might know it, it's called Root Shock. I have it right here. I'm my mother's daughter, so I have to say this as one of our themes. But she wrote a book called Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It. And uh, she interviewed people decades after they lost their neighborhoods to urban renewal to understand what that loss meant. And um, the losses that people suffer when they lose their neighborhoods and they lose those societal connections are um, social, but also 
wealth and it undermines people's health in such a severe way and it undermines our whole society and we have to just say that when we're planning and thinking about the future of our neighborhoods and the future of our cities displacement is not okay it's never okay there's a lot of themes in planning to say like i mean we all know robert moses like you break a few eggs to make an omelet there's it just that's we're, we're, we can't have that anymore we just have to say no i personally was recently um gentrified out of the neighborhood where I lived for 12 years. So obviously I'm processing what that means, right? Um, but I think that we have to hold this really, really deeply and profoundly. As a colleague just shared this metaphor the other day that it's like when you break a glass in the kitchen and then you sweep it up, you see all those broken shards, right? But then a few days later, you find shards in the living room. And so it's like, maybe we don't see what's happening to the people who are displaced because they're not there. But there, the destruction is being done. And so we just are going to say no to that. And this photo is by a dear colleague and friend and mentor of you of oh, Dominic Molden, who's really documenting people's struggles to fight for their neighborhoods around the world. Um, next slide, please. So next um, is this idea. One thing I really love about working with Kenny and Lori in the design studio is that they're always pushing us to um, push the boundaries of how we're thinking about and defining our what public means and public space. So at U of O, we had the real honor of working with Kenny and Lori and Aya to write this guide on horizontal development versus vertical development and really dig in to what does it mean to plan for people and not just thinking about profit as your bottom line. Um, so we were thinking through, you know, what are the characteristics of horizontal development and uh, looking at these great case studies. And we had this really great idea that we would use, we would analyze the new master plan for the city of Orange using the horizontal development framework. Um, and this was going to help us learn and teach. And then the first obstacle we had was that the plan was really dense and hard to understand and opaque. And so, um, and, and the data was confusing. So we ended up doing a class on how to understand the data in the plan. And so eventually we were really able to dig into it, but it's really making us think about how we think about the information we share as a form of public space. Um, and for example, Orange right now is considering some rezoning and the maps, the digitized maps that they're sharing are illegible on a computer and further impossible to read on a phone. But in Orange, the phone is the way people are interacting with their government right now. They're attending city council meetings on their phone. So we have to do better. How we're sharing information is a way of being in public space and it's messaging our values. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that we think about a lot at U of O, and there's Aubrey in this picture with me, is um, the idea of storytelling as public space. So um, the stories that we tell about places, and this um, is just so clear when you're reading ideas, arrangements, effects, that ideas produce arrangements, which produce effects. The stories, we, sh we have collective stories. There are shared stories, there are shared narratives, and they are so meaningful and they can, when we tell negative stories about places, they can open up worlds of untold damage. So we have to think about how we create opportunities to share multiple stories, to uplift spaces, to be clear that everyone's story has a place in like the mosaic of stories about our cities and our places. And that's a huge part of welcoming and public space. Um, this was a project we did at U of O where we worked with middle school students to create a textbook about orange for third graders. And um, you can see, this is a quote from one of the students who's saying that, she says, being a part of Orange, most people would leave any chance they get, but having this experience of exploring the city and being able to write the story changed that for these middle school students. Um, so, so we really want to uplift the role of storytelling and narrative as a part of the public space. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then lastly, what we wanted to share is that you need to have a welcoming process. Um, one of our dear colleagues who actually introduced me to the design studio, Kiara Nagel, who's a really fantastic organizer, she uh, really has taught me so much about the belief that you have to enact what you're organizing for as you're doing it. So if you want to have an event about a thing, <laughs> 
like your process to build up to that event has to embody the thing. So if you're doing something for youth and there's not youth at the table, like what are you doing? So it's like, and she always talks a lot about, um, are you making an elegant invitation? So we really adopted that at University of Orange. If we're having an event, if we're inviting people to a community meeting, how are, is this, is this invitation elegant? You know, and how does each stage of the process, including how we meet with each other as colleagues, how is each stage of the process emulating the result that we want to see? Um, this photo is of a dear colleague, Lourdes Rodriguez, and uh, she did work in northern Manhattan that was really addressing part of this problem that I mentioned earlier around parks in lower income neighborhoods not being planned generously, being planned as sort of a leftover thought. So there was this really interesting series of parks along a cliff and a bunch of colleagues at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia had the idea to think about creating a hiking trail connecting these parks. At the time, the parks had been very, very um, disinvested, but they were also this really amazing resource for communities. So Lourdes decided that uh, as they were thinking about the ways they could reconnect the neighborhood to the parks and be programming the parks, that she would just basically have all of her meetings in the parks. And she adopted a practice of walking meetings. Um, and I'm just going to read to you what she said about that. One of the challenges faced was the disconnection between the perception people had of many of the spaces we were talking about and the reality. For many longtime residents who had lived through the 1985 to 1995 violence epidemic in Northern Manhattan, parts of our parks were scary spaces to avoid at all costs. The periphery was safe, but venturing in was not encouraged. The reality was that despite the work that remained, fixing stairs, opening access points, many efforts already in place were not visible. For example, some newly paved trails went unhiked. A lot of the debris from the time the parks were informal junkyards had been cleared, but not many people knew. Um, so she talks about having walking meetings as a way to engage people in storytelling and just being in the space. And at the end, she says, we were also able to promote falling in love. When you fall in love with a place, you long for it and want to visit it. You also fight for it and become involved in making it better leading to genuine and sustainable community mobilization. So I will leave you with that. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. We're going to switch from Molly over to Anthony. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Kenny, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're in my field of view. So if you want to give me like a two minute sort of situation when I'm coming close to the end. Yes. That would be helpful. Um, I don't have any slides, I don't have a presentation. I'm gonna try to catch a wave and then hopefully we can ride that vibe together. Um, but first I wanna say thank you for the invitation. And I wanna thank Emma and Kenny for grounding us in the way that they did. Um, there are some familiar faces uh, and names on this call. So, um, so I feel held by that familiarity and that relation and I want to thank you all and, and some of you all may have have heard this in, in other calls but what I appreciate about the grounding is that it is both um, that, it, that it attempts to resist both a white supremacist demand that we forget and the settler demand to um, to be removed right settler colonialism and all of its manifestations is always about a kind of removal whether that's through cultural genocide or death um, and so I think any, any opportunity for us to resist removal by way of remembering uh, and kind of memorializing our, our relation and our being with human and non-humankind is always, is always a good place to start. So my name is Anthony. I'm an artist. Um, I think of my work as being primarily situated within performance. And for me, what that means is that I'm primarily concerned with what things do, um, with what kinds of effects that doing has on the world and the ways in which those effects get consolidated to forms, impressions of things. And I, I think it's probably that, that proclivity that, that leads me to Kenny and Lori's thinking around ideas, arrangements, and effects. So I grew up brown in, in working class in a, in a small town environment in the Texas Hill Country. 
and am by all accounts a border subject, right? Which is that I am a byproduct of um, the, the securitized and militarized and, and sometimes migrant border state. And I think that also kind of informs my thinking in many ways um, in terms of uh, not only ideas of intercultural exchange in public space, but also, um, you know, what I know to be true in terms of the flexibility of, of these kind of in-between spaces, right, of, of, the, of the interstitial. But before I get too far ahead of myself, um, one, because Kenny, Kenny asked in, in the framing that I speak a little bit about how I think about artists' role in the public space, but also how artists kind of interact with municipalities through my own work. And one, one way is that, you know, I think artists, because we operate most of the time in the realm of, of producing imaginaries, um, you know, and again, because I'm, I'm a performance person, I, I think not, I think not just about the production of the, that imaginary, but about how we then enact those imaginaries. So another way to say that would be that, you know, when I talk to my students, I tell them that, you know, in, in art school, we are thinking constantly about materials and forms. Sometimes those materials are paint and canvas and the form is the picture. Sometimes it's clay and fire and the form is the pot or the vessel. And I think for the, those of us who, who participate as artists in, in the public realm, in civic engagement, in community engagement, the materials that we think about are not only people in space and time, of course that would be true, that's why we're here now, but also how policy, how planning, how local governments, how all of these things become materials to produce the form of a neighborhood or the form of a city a state, a nation, et cetera, which is maybe just a way to, to kind of circle back to Kenny's thinking and framing out of, of this idea of spatial justice and in the ways in which the spaces that we interact with on a daily basis have been produced for us um, by people who maybe have never been to those spaces, right? By people who, who made decisions based on data, based on profit, um, based on presuppositions, based on ideas about how people should move, how they should gather or not. And then therefore arranged our, our lives in such a way. And some of this, I think for me, you know, I maybe would have a different perspective six months ago, but at this particular moment, you know, and, and again, kind of following Kenny and Lori's thinking, um, in, in a really great text of uh, social justice in a time of social distancing, which they wrote. So if you haven't read that, I would encourage you all to do that. Um, because I think really one of the things that we're wrestling with at this precise moment is um, the new social arrangements, which have been brought on by a global health crisis on the one hand and by rebellion and insurgency on the other. This is not to say that these things didn't exist prior to this year or prior to 2016. It's simply to say that many things which, uh, you know, certainly for, for most folks of color of a certain class status, um, many things that we would know to be true from our life experiences are now true to a broader public or have now, have now been unveiled. And so the ways in which our lives are, are designed and kind of preconditioned by ideas um, is, is certainly part of, of how we think and, and probably try not to move through the world at this moment. Um, so where I think artists kind of interject into these ideas, into this framing is precisely around recognizing the resources and the materials which are already embedded in a place, in a context, and being able to imagine from those resources, from those materials, new forms. You know, and, and I think that we don't produce those imaginaries on our own, right? We, we produce those imaginaries um, through sociality, through collectivity, through mutuality, um, through relation. And I think that where I've come to think of that process or where I've come to call that process, what I've come to call that process now 
is a kind of relational homemaking. You know, that, that really what I, what I want to think about in terms of how we remake a, a neighborhood, for example, um, how we remake a city, is how we form the, the relational bonds necessary um, for us to make that place a home, right? You know, and obviously part of that, you know, just to be totally transparent, it's like that's, you know, I imagine a lot of us are thinking about our homes at this precise moment. Um, and, and whether or not we feel comfortable um, or uncomfortable or whether we ever feel safe or unsafe in that environment. And I think that those feelings, you know, again, I think one, one of the opportunities, which is maybe a bit vulgar uh, of a word, so I apologize, but one of the opportunities in this moment is the ways in which we recognize that that, that same truth of how we're reflecting on the safety of our home um, is a truth that many people have to live on the street every day, right? Um, and so I think really, for me, it's really a, a kind of question of, of homemaking, um, which is the way that I think that um, is an opportunity, I think, to kind of reframe this question of planning in public space, not towards utility or profit or, or security and property, but towards, um, but towards home, towards care. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think I'm turning it over to Emma to break us into small groups. Sure thing. Hi, and thank you again to Kenny and Molly and Anthony for your remarks. Um, so yes, we will be uh, putting you into small groups, five people. So nice intimate space and hopefully you can all get a chance to know each other for a bit. Um, and so we just have a few, uh, again, quick guidelines for those small group discussions. Um, we will be in these rooms for about 15 minutes before we come back together for a Q&A uh, with uh, everyone, including our speakers at the end. Um, but when you enter your small groups, we just invite you to go around the digital room, as it were, and share your name, uh, your pronouns, your location, um, and your role and also where you see uh, points of potential implementation of some of the ideas uh, that our speakers have presented within the context that you work in. Um, and if you have some time together, generate some questions that you would like to bring back to ask our speakers as well. Um, we'll put those kind of prompts in the chat and we'll also give you reminders um, in your room so that you know when it's time to come back to the main room. And we will also put the kind of guidelines for discussion that I shared at the beginning of this event in the chat as well, so that you have those too. Um, um, let's have Q&A put in the stack um, and I will call upon you and hopefully you can then put the question out to the We'll, we'll try to get you off of mute so you can use your question. I like to voice my question rather than put it in chat. Is that okay? Can you unmute yourself? Barack? Uh, so folks are not able to unmute themselves, but as you call on people's names, I can unmute them. Okay, then Barack had a question he wanted to throw in. So unmute Barack and we'll let him ask the question. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Is that, yes. okay, thank you for nodding your heads. Um, I'm, uh, my name is actually pronounced Bodic. Uh, this is I'm director of programs for Three Walls in Chicago. Um, hello, Anthony. Um, and I'm really interested in this conversation around space of justice. I think what came up in our small um, and short um, discussion, uh, for me, particularly as a disabled identified individual is a role of disability justice and speaking to disabled folk within the sphere of spatial justice. Like I think that for me, I feel like I have not heard that within this conversation. 
and I feel like it is consistently neglected and marginalized kind of aspect when we're speaking to social justice. And I see that intersectionally recognizing that um, for black and brown indigenous folks of color, those who are disabled live consistently and are navigating uh, the ways in which public spaces are not built for them. So I'm wondering how we might engage in thinking about disability justice within this conversation of spatial justice. I mean, I think that that's my ultimate uh, question. I think the other thing in relationship to that is that we have the opportunity now, given COVID, to be in the virtual space, which means that for a lot of disabled folks who are not physically present in those public spaces, is a chance for them to build and shape and reimagine the public spaces we return to. So I'm wondering in this way how we might also think about the intersection of virtual space in relationship to building these public spaces and thinking about social justice. So those are my those are my questions and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go first, Molly or Anthony? I just want to say thank you um, for calling that to my attention. I actually was thinking about that when I was I really wanted to share um, Lourdes's story about the walking meetings because I love when she talks about it, it's such a beautiful methodology. And I was like, you know, there is, um, that does have to do with who's able-bodied and who's able to go and walk these parks. So we ha and I know that those were questions that came up as they were exploring the parks. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I think you, I don't have an answer. I just want to thank you for sharing. And um, if you want to invite us to a meeting in the Zoom virtual space. I appreciate, I really appreciate you saying that, you know, one of the ways we can use this space in these times. So if you ever want to think together, thank you for that. Anthony? Um, so we, we know each other and it's really good to hear your voice because I haven't heard your voice. So I'm very happy that, uh, haven't heard your voice in a minute. So I'm very happy that you unmuted yourself. And I appreciate, as, as always, this call. Um, I, you know, I think, I think this for me uh, foregrounds this question of care. You know, and I think that, that, that there's, a, there's a, a position that deserves to be centered, which is that we are only temporarily able-bodied. You know, and I, I think that, that the reality is that, um, you know, and, and particularly maybe in, a, in this moment of crisis, there, there is a, a great opportunity for us to reorient our, our thinking away from a, an ableist approach to, to gathering and collectivity. Um, and one that recognizes that there is a greater opportunity for us to create spaces that care for each other, um, that allow us to care for each other and allow us to care for ourselves. Um, and, and that maybe by foregrounding that, this, this becomes this way to resist, um, to resist ableism inside of this question of space. But um, I also love this opportunity of the virtual space. Um, I mean, I, I, I have questions and I have concerns around uh, accessibility, um, both technological, but also literacies um, and the extent to which organizations and, um, and kind of emerging publics will be able to meet uh, captioning and, 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 um, and text and, and all, all kinds of, of, of needs in, uh, in regards to, to allowing folks to, to equally access the ideas of the virtual space, uh, ideas that are present in the virtual space. Um, and I think I also, there, there, there were some questions um, there are some other maybe capitalist oriented questions over our reliance on these kinds of technologies and whether there aren't better platforms um, available to us that might be um, more useful in, in terms of, of moving towards justice, uh, all, all, all manners of justice at the same time. Um, but I, I think that you, what you're pointing towards 
what I hear you pointing towards, what I feel myself being pulled towards, is really this way in which we are able to foreground um, disability justice in this environment um, and really create more inclusive spaces. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the call to think of this too as a public space, this, this Zoom room too as a space for us to enact spatial justice. Um, I really appreciate that. That was certainly something that, um, that I hadn't thought of before. So thank you. Thanks. And thanks for the question. I'm going to go to Omniyoshi's question. Um, what design interventions uh, could we have in public spaces to protect Black, Brown, and Indigenous people from unwarranted interactions with police? Um, I actually um, think that we need to think a lot more about how we put our bodies or how we coordinate bodies in space. Um, I think we need to think a lot more about um, the, the kind of template um, that we saw um, sort of happening in Portland with the moms, um, the, um, the moms sort of blocking, drawing a, a line between themselves. And I forgot, the, what's the mom's full name? Um, well, there, there were a set of moms in, in, in Portland, Oregon, who created blocks between themselves and, um, and the, the, the sort of that, militariz that militarized force that was coming down that Trump was um, putting out to sort of say we want the wall of moms. Thank you, Cecily. Um, I think we, we, need to, we need to take that template up and see lot, lots, lots more walls. Um, around um, around the spaces, around the neighborhoods where those kinds of things happen. I think um, it's the next sort of, I think it's, it's a potential template for a next sort of spatial, visual, embodied kind of statement, uh, kind of building a both symbolic and practical statement that says we don't want to live in a society that creates borders between sort of black and indigenous people and the rest of America. Um, and then polices the bodies of people on one side of the border um, to sort of signify to people on the other side that you're not those people. <laughs> so that's, I, that's one strategy I, I'm excited about. Uh, anything um, you're thinking, Molly or Anthony? Molly, did, did you, I, well, here, maybe I'll, I'll offer a thought. Um, I think this is where this kind of, um, you know, what, what we're being pulled towards in, in this resurgent rebellion. Um, and as we really, you know, and, and as this kind of greater public discourse around abolition um, emerges is really what has to happen if we take an abolitionist approach or perspective, right, in the ways in which we could really, um, what, what we would be able to do in terms of scaffolding out our communities and creating opportunities of support and care for each other if we weren't overfunding police departments uh, or if we got rid of police departments altogether. And so I think in the terms of this question of like, well, how do we keep this community safe, which I think is related to the first question in the sense that like, we could, like, let's say in the city of Chicago, for example, and I'm just using that as an example because I, I most recently saw these numbers. You know, the, the police department accounts for like 40% of the city budget. What we, we could do if we freed up that amount of money is like, you know, put in better crosswalks, put in better ramps, widen sidewalks. We could create mental health centers. We could invest in public school systems. We could create opportunities for, you know, black, brown, indigenous communities of color create after school programs, we could do a lot of things. Um, and so I think in terms of like, how do we, how do we, this question of, of policing and safety for me really is a question of like, if we were to recenter these communities, as opposed to centering property, what could we do? And how could we keep each other safe? 
um, if we if we thought about our relation to each other differently. And Michelle La Poetica Richardson has a hand up. So can somebody um, unmute um, Michelle so Michelle can ask the question? Hello. Can Go everybody ahead. hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, it's wonderful to be in this space with so many magnificent people trying to create space for people. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, as far as when it comes to creating spaces for people with disabilities, um, be, being being someone that has um, physical um, you know ailments that that create uh, a situation where I need to have proper seating. Um, you know, or, or I can't go down downstairs on some days when my when my when my physical um, condition isn't great. I know that that's um, something that with this with this whole digital revolution um, is expanding our horizon when it comes to creating platforms for people to be included. But um, there's also a component when it comes to people that have um, certain uh, phobias when it comes to cameras and being in front of the camera and 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 being a part of, of, of these situations when they're in front of a camera. So what about people that have mental health issues um, or disabilities, if you will, when it comes to anxieties and things like that? And, and, and how, how can we protect them or help them? Because I know when I held open mics, you know, it's, it's different when you have that one-on-one. -on -one. How are you able to provide something like that to somebody that perhaps is having a little bit of performance anxiety before they go up on their turn or things like that? How, how would you be able to address something like that? Thank you, Michelle. And I'm going to sneak this last question in and then let either of you answer um, one or both. Um, the last question from Daniel Koff. Um, could the panelists talk more about the strategies for horizontal planning versus vertical planning? Our group was curious to learn more. Um, so, and I think we're just gonna have time for those two, so. Um, Do you want me to just address that really quickly, Kenny? Yes. Is Oh, perfect. So Lori put that in the chat, and um, if you go to that link in the chat, you can download this guide that the University of Orange created with the design studio. Um, read through it and then get back in touch with us because we would love to talk to you about it more. So that's my short answer, thank you. Do you wanna add anything else about that? I think. Yeah, definitely just check out the guide and keep in touch. Just say, just quickly say, um, I guess in your two sentences, what's the difference between horizontal development versus vertical development? Well, it's interesting because I think it really speaks to what Anthony was just saying, that it's really at the heart of it. It's how are we centering community and people and care versus centering profit as we're making decisions. And what does that look like as a dynamic process when we're thinking about how we're growing our communities? Um, yeah, at U of all, we often start with the question, how do we facilitate neighborhood change that isn't harmful to the people in the neighborhood? Thank you. And Anthony, did you have anything for, the, for Michelle's question or the horizontal vertical question? Um, I think for Michelle's question, I, I, I really am enjoying the, enjoying the space that's opening up. Um, which almost seems to layer our kind of virtual commons, if we were to call that this, that, um, despite it being owned by a corporation, is like that this, this, this um, alternate public space, which now exists above the public space that we have limited access to, um, or the, the public space, which now we all make a calculated ju judgment uh, around risk when we enter, that the layering of, of these two spaces on top of each other um, feels like such an interesting um, space to begin uh, a dialogue that that really asks us, like, to you know, to Michelle's point, how do we um, how do we think about creating community um, in the absence of our bodies? Uh, in the absence of our body's ability to relate to each other and in time and space. Um, yeah, I don't know, no answers, but, um, but I, I, I find the call to be um, quite
quite rewarding. Thanks. I think with that, we turn it back over to Emma. Thank you, Kenny. Um, and thanks to all of you for your questions. Um, as we just noted in the chat, we'll also share out the links that folks have been dropping in the chat in a follow-up email after this event so that everyone has those resources. Um, I actually uh, would love to just quickly hand it off to Kim to uh, make some quick closing remarks. Um, so I will. Thanks, Emma, and big thank you to Kenny and Anthony and Molly for leading today's conversation. Um, really appreciated it, and um, thanks for opening opening up the dialogue. And can't wait to continue it um, over the next um, the next few weeks. I'll I'll do one last shameless plug for the new book. I know it it's appearing on your screen backwards, but it's a beautiful publication, and you can buy it on the DS4SI website. So that's my shameless plug for this book. It's real. It's hard. It's an actual book and not just looking at a screen. <laughs> um, although you can read it on the screen. Um, and uh, I almost forgot what I was supposed to do with the wrap up. Um, big thank you. And yes, thanks. Um, I was just going to do a quick plug for our new grant opportunities and um, talking a lot with Kenny and Lori about spatial justice and public art. Um, we decided in the midst of this pandemic to launch two new grant opportunities and um, they're really focused on this idea of uh, who has the right to be thread, express, and connect in public spaces and how, how can and does public art um, help facilitate um, greater spatial justice. So the first grant is a collective imagination for spatial justice opportunity and this is really for doing that work of imagination. Um, Kenny started us off with uh, some visuals about uh, spaces that exemplify the white imaginary. How do we diversify our imagination of what public space looks like? So um, this supports teams of artists, creatives, culture bearers, cultural organizers, and community-based collaborators to do this important work of imagining public art that fosters and contributes to more just futures and um, more just public spaces and public culture. Um, you can learn more uh, the, at the URL right on that slide. It's imagine.org slash imagine spatial justice. And then our other grant opportunity is public art for spatial justice. Um, you know, we, the collective imagination grant is really supporting the work of imagination that should happen before you start planning and implementing and applying for grants. Too often public art grants are asking you um, to know what you're going to do before you imagine it. <laughs> so the collective imagination grant gives you an opportunity to focus on that imagination work and then um, to come back for a public art for spatial justice grant um, that supports Massachusetts artists and artistic collaborations to create public art here in Massachusetts that fosters um, greater public imagination and contributes to more um, spatial justice in our communities. Um, these two grants really came out of some um, wonderful conversations with our collabor collaborators at DS4SI and um, really thankful for their thinking on this. And our first deadline is Monday, uh, August 24th, but it's kind of a rolling deadline. So we'll have another deadline in September and another one in October for both grant opportunities. So you can definitely go to the website, learn more. Um, and if Monday's too soon for you to submit an application, um, definitely think about the other uh, deadlines coming up. Um, and if you ever have questions about NEFA's public art programs or grant making, you can reach us at publicart.nefa.org. Um, and last but not least, uh, our next discussion is next Tuesday, August 23rd. Um, from 2 to 3.30 p.m., um, same time, same place, same land. Um, and we'll be focusing on making it public, activating public spaces for creativity, connection, and celebration. Um, Lori will be facilitating a conversation with Roberto Bodoya and Karen Young. Um, for those of you who might not know either of them, they're really wonderful people. Uh, Roberto 
is the cultural affairs manager for the city of Oakland. Um, and Karen Young is the founding director of Thank You Sparks here in Boston. Um, and if you haven't registered yet, um, yes, Sasha tossed the link in the chat. Um, I think those were all of my announcements. Emma, was there anything else that you were supposed to mention? We're good. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all again for joining us.